what do we think it's going to take to create the punch in the face for this country and this economy and this environment for us to make change? You know what concerns me, and I, having never said this out loud, I don't even know how to articulate it exactly, but along the lines of you're asking what is the punch in the face for this country, and I would say here's my greatest fear about that. I think that we are punch in the face proof in the sense that we are two countries. We are the country that says, United States of America, that's on your dollar bill. We're the country that has a government and all of those things, and they have absolutely nothing to do with what it is to live in America right. and to be an American. And until those things relate and until people actually realize, oh, we could do something, there's, there's a complete dissonance between people and, and state. So. Anna? Well, I don't know. I mean, the new project I'm working on, which is about schools and failed schools and the people who um, uh, don't get to experience, you know, at least sort of school learning as a joyous matter. I mean, I think they get punched in the face every single day from the time before they're born. Um, and so if not before they're born, soon after they're born. And I don't think that's about a sort of uh, idea of being able to take a risk. I think it's their life. Um, and they don't get a chance to have a plan. Uh, and I think the riskiest thing for us to do about that would be to see how we could encourage and coerce and try to bring people to be, like we have in different times in American history, um, concerned about more than just ourselves and the people who we think that we love, and to go to a bigger idea of love, which is really not just about cuddling, but really reaching and saying, you know, about those who really don't have and are living broken lives with broken hearts, bring them to me rather than put them over there as far away from me as you possibly can. Because I don't want to see them, I don't want them to contaminate my children, I don't want them to mess up my fabulous life about who I am. And we're really, really far from developing that imagination. So I just think there's a lot of people getting punched in the face every single day. They don't need to be looking for a risk. So there could be something about what we're doing, which is a little, I don't know, it's not really risky. Because it's, uh, you know, we're just having a good time talking. If states and cities and whatever can identify, which we know they can, who these children are very early on, in, in, kinder, in some areas in kindergarten, in, in third grade, we know who will not graduate from high school then what is the extreme both passivity and, and roadblock to actually taking action? And I, th I, I mean, I always think that, again, realizing that each of us is capable of doing for others and of change, but there's an enormous amount of both passivity and frustration, but how do we then make those things happen? We lack imagination. Just this idea that, you know, the, the suffering of seven billion people is yours. Right. That takes an extraordinary imagination to believe that. It's a real act of imagination. But I think anything that has moved in the world because of compassion is because it was an extraordinary act of imagination. In reality, I have absolutely nothing to do with you. You're here and I'm here. You're here and I'm here. You're here and I'm here. So to imagine that I can really feel for you or of you, even in acting, the empathic imagination right. is an imagination. I can't really feel like you felt. I think that this, you know, the crisis that uh, I'm interested in right now is the one about how to start to build a really healthy, robust moral imagination.